Welcome everyone to our 21st class of Sharbi Tachan. I'm your host, Chai Ben Shimon. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem is going to give to us. Let's give generously so Hashem can and will give us generously. I'm going to put some coins in the Sadaka box. Please join me from home. We're going to say Psalm 20, Kapitol Chaf, for the hostages, immediate and safety return, and for the protection of all the Jews around the world, and for the safety and protection for the Chayalim and Chayalot in the IDF, and Hashem should help them fulfill their mission now. So I'm going to say it a little slow so you can join along. Lam Natsayach Mizmar David Yancha. Yancha Adenai Biyam Tzara Yisagef Hashem Elohei Akai Yishlach Ezracha Mikaidash Umitzian Yisadecha Yiskar Kol Min Yiskar Kol Min Chaisecha Ba'ilaska Yirash Nesela Yitain Lacha Chalva Vevcha Vechol Atzascha Yimalei Nirana Nabi Shuasecha Uveshem Eloheinu Nidgo Yimalei Adenai Kol Meshal Hasecha Ata Yadaiti Ki Aishia Adenai Mishicha Yanehu Mishmei Katshay Bigurois Hishayim Minai Ela Varacha Ve'Ela Vasusim Ba'Nachnu B'Shem Adenai Eloheinu Nasker if we only knew the power of Tehillim, we would say it day and night. So we're going to introduce to you again, Devor Leandruzier. Thank you for being here, a Sharbi Tachan enthusiast and an addiction recovery coach and many more hats. Thank you so much and looking forward to this class. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Okay, so what we just discussed, our topic is why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. And we went through the first three reasons. Reason number one is they potentially had a previous sin. Reason number two is to be able to suffer here on this earth in order to get a better, better portion in the world to come. And number three, to teach others how suffering should not hinder their divine service and their connection with Hashem. So now we are on the bottom of page 94 with the fourth reason. There are some righteous people who suffer due to the wickedness of the people of their generation. And the creator tests him with poverty, want, and illness to demonstrate to others his piety and service of God. This is to contrast to those other people who don't serve God despite their peaceful lives, as the verse says, Indeed, he bore illnesses and carried our pains. So this is saying that the righteous people who suffer, within their suffering, they remain connected. And this is something that I see in Israel over and over and over again. So there is a young girl. Her name is Tamari, actually a close family friend of ours. And she was dating a young man for a while. They were set to get married. He was called to duty on October 7th, and he was injured. And when they say injured in Israel, it doesn't mean, you know, a little black and blue mark or a scrape. He lost his leg. And for Tamari, it wasn't even a question that she shouldn't marry him, knowing what her life would be like with this young man, Shachar, who is an incredible human being, strong and determined, she it wasn't even a thought for her because the relationship that they had was not about his physical body. It was a soul and heart connection. So for her, it was, it was not even a question. Like I said to her, wow, how amazing you are that you're you're saying and you're going to be with Shachar and it's going to be the most beautiful thing. Now, Baruch Hashem, they're already married. And it was a beautiful, beautiful celebration. There's so many videos of this, this, this couple at the chuppah itself. He managed to hold on and actually break the glass himself. And it was it was emotional, tear-filled, but the most beautiful experience. What was Tamari saying? It's not about your physicality. It's not about the materialism. I'm connected to you on a deep level. Our neshamas are connected. Our hearts are connected. What is it that Hashem is saying here? Is that's how righteous people are. Whatever it is that they're experiencing, they're, they, they're saying to themselves, yes, I'm feeling challenged. Yes, 
this is something that isn't doesn't feel good doesn't feel doesn't make me happy i'm in pain whatever the challenge is but regardless throughout i will maintain my connection with hashem okay top of page uh, 95 Top of page 95 is reason number five. There are some righteous people who suffer because although righteous in their private lives, they are not zealous for the sake of God in protesting the sins of the people of their generation. As we know from the story of Ailey, the high priest and his sons, about whom the verse says, and it will be that everyone who is left in your house will come to prostrate himself before him for a silver piece and a morsel of bread. So what was it that happened with Ailey? We can we can take the example of King Menashe. Menashe was the worst king that the Jewish people have ever had. Chizkiyahu, his father, was known as one of the most incredible kings. He, Menashe, took the Jewish people and brought them into idolatry. He brought Avodah Zarah, idol worship, into the Beit HaMikdash. He brought paganism to the Jews. But Hashem did not punish him. What happened? The Syrians at that time were conquering all of the lands. But they said, this kingdom is so weak. We're not even going to attempt to conquer them because it's unnecessary. What we're going to do is just grab the king. The king is the most important part of every country. So they grab the king and they torture him brutally. They brutally, brutally torture him. So what does he do? He cries out to his idols, his gods. And obviously there's no answer. There's no help forthcoming. So in the, at the edge of desperation, he reaches out to Hashem and he says, please, I have no other option. I need you to help me. So what would one thing Hashem would respond? How would another human being respond? Listen, you lived completely contrary to what I told you to do. You, even when they were torturing you, you still continued to reach out to your fake idols and your fake idol worship. And now because you're desperate, you're coming to me. But Hashem is absolutely contrary to that. Hashem is goodness and kindness. And Hashem is not looking to punish us. Hashem is not looking to hurt us. Hashem is actually looking for a space where he could say, okay, there's a little space where this person is ready to return to me. And because Menashe reached out to Hashem in the depths of desperation where there was nothing else, Hashem freed him from the Syrians and allowed him to remain king for the Jewish people for an additional 30 years. And obviously then he became good and just king. Okay. Um, where are we? The list is carried out. The five. Okay. So here I'm going to tell another story of Rabbi Greenblatt. Rabbi Greenblatt is a fourth grade teacher. And it's during the 2008 financial crisis. It's a major financial crisis in America, probably throughout the world, but I'm not familiar with that. And the people who normally donate to this yeshiva are calling and saying, I'm so sorry, I know that every year I give you this big donation, but this year I can't do it. And another person, and another person, and another person. So the yeshiva has no choice and they have to buckle down on those people who are unable to pay tuition. So the administration says to this rabbi, Greenblatt, you're going to have to send home four notes to four different children today to tell their parents that if they cannot pay, they unfortunately cannot come back to school. So Rabbi Greenblatt says this in his story. He says this was the hardest and most painful day of his life. But he had to write these letters. He writes these letters. He seals the letters. And he says to the children, bring these home to your parents and make sure that they read them. The next morning of the four students, one student shows up. And the rabbi doesn't know what to do with himself. Like, I sent the notes home. What am I supposed to do now? And he's torn. 
So he doesn't say anything, obviously, in front of the rest of the class. But during recess, comes to this young boy and he says to him, oh, I'm going to tell you his name is that exactly, Yassi Mandel. He says to him, did you send, give your mom the note? So the young boy starts to cry. He drops his backpack and out of his backpack falls an envelope. Now, Rabbi Greenblatt knows that this Yassi Mandel lost his father and that this mother is managing her children on her own. So he takes out the envelope that falls out of the backpack. Get emotional. When I heard the story, I get emotional when I repeat the story. And out of the envelope falls an engagement ring. And there's a written note that says, the holy words of Torah coming out of my child's mouth are more important to me than jewelry or anything physical. Now, this was her engagement ring from her deceased husband. And if she can't pay tuition, she probably doesn't have a lot left from her husband. But she was committed enough to say, take my ring and this will be for a full year's tuition for my child. Now, on a personal note, that story bothers me on multiple levels, but we're not going to get into that here. But this woman's bitachon and her trust and her desire to have her child stay connected and learn Torah was so remarkable that she was willing to give up the last possession that she had from her deceased husband. Okay, so now we're going to continue. What is it? What was it? I'm still to continue with the story. Um, what she was saying is, I want my child to have a deep, meaningful relationship with Hashem. That is what this book that we are learning is all about. It's not, okay, Hashem, I trust you. It's really cultivating this deep, meaningful relationship. When you're in a relationship with someone, there's a give and take. I give you, I do for you the things that you ask of me. And the things that Hashem is asking of us happen to be what is actually good for us, will help us live our best lives. And then Hashem does for us all the time. What he's requiring of us is good for us. And what he does for us is everything that we need or want is taken care of. Not necessarily the way that we see it, but the way that, excuse me, Hashem sees it because he sees a much bigger picture than we do. Okay. So now we are going to start with, on the bottom of page 95, reasons why wicked people prosper. Okay. Until now, the author has been giving explanations for why the righteous suffer. Now we will turn to discuss why we find that many people, wicked people, prosper and lead pleasant lives. But the good that God may he be blessed performs on behalf of the wicked are for the following reasons. Number one, there are some wicked people who prosper due to their previous good deeds for which God rewards them in this world, as the verse states, and he repays those who hate him to their face to cause them to perish, which one of the early commentaries was translated as follows, and he rewards those who hate him for the good deeds that they have performed before him in this world in order to ultimately destroy them in the world to come. That sounds extremely harsh, but here we are talking about actual wicked people. So it's saying, if they previously did something positive, Hashem wants to repay them because Hashem says, Hashem, Hashem does never has any debts with us. So if a wicked person did something good, even though he's wicked, Hashem will repay him with kindness for the good deed that he did. So Hashem gives him that repayment of kindness here on this earth, on, in this world, so that he can suffer more in the world to come. That is explanation number one. Number two. There are some wicked people whose good fortune is like a deposit to be kept by him 
and it remains with him until God will give him a righteous son who will be deserving of it. The wicked person only amasses wealth so that his righteous son can inherit it. As the verse states, he will prepare and a righteous man will wear them. Similarly, it says, but to the sinner, he has given an occupation to gather and to accumulate, to give him who he is before God. Okay. Okay, we are now on number three, bottom of page 96. It is possible that the wicked person is giving good so that, that it will be the main cause for his death or his bad fortune. As it is written, riches kept by their owner for his harm. So what does that mean? Hashem is allowing him to have good things to prosper here on this earth so that he may suffer in the world to come. What does that mean? What is he saying? When a person amasses a great amount of money, let's say they're a good person, right? They're even connected to Hashem. And all of a sudden they make an amazing amount of money. What happens is all kinds of bad behaviors come up. When you're in that circle, I'm now rich. I can do whatever I want. All kinds of things can happen. We become dismissive of our children. We no longer value our spouse. There could be all kinds of inappropriate behaviors. And we descend into a very dark, bleak place. Um, great amount of money is a huge, huge test. It's a huge nisayan to be able to have a great amount of money and still stay connected and humble and trusting. So here it's saying that Hashem allows them to have this here because that is how they, on their own, self-destruct. The Rambam said, the worst evil is the evil that we do to ourselves, and then we blame God for it. So very famous Mr. Elon Musk. What does he teach people? What does he tell people? He's one of the richest people in the world. He worked, he says, when I had PayPal, when I had Tesla, I lived in my office. I worked day and night. So was he working because he needed to? Did he have everything that he needed? Yes, he did. He was working for unnecessary money, an amount of money that he couldn't or his even his great grandchildren couldn't spend in a lifetime. So the money that we're talking about here, the money, the hishtablis, the, the work that we are required to do is to have that which we need to be able to take care of our families, to be able to give charity, to help others. We do not need more and more and more like our Western culture. It's never enough. And when that happens, we self-destruct. We self-destruct because the temptations that we have when we can do whatever we want, are so strong that our physical body cannot take the pressure. Our neshama gets quieter, gets shut down, and our physical self starts to flourish, and that is how we self-destruct. Okay, top of page 97, number four. Additionally, it is possible that despite being wicked, the creator allows him to have good fortune for a while while he repents and will be deserving of it, as we know from the story of King Menashe. So we already shared the story of King Menashe, that Hashem says, you know what? He's not behaving properly. He's not doing what he's supposed to. But I'm a patient God. I will sit here and wait. I'm going to give him the good things in life. I'm going to let him have happiness. I'm going to let him have health. I'm going to let him have, health, have wealth. Let me see then what he does with these blessings that I'm giving him that at the moment he absolutely doesn't deserve. Is this wicked man going to say, wow, wow, look at me. I'm behaving like a rotten dude. I am not doing what I'm supposed to. And Hashem is still showering me with everything that I could possibly ask for. It only makes sense for me to repent and do what God wants. So. That's reason number four. Reason number five. 
there are some wicked people who might be given good fortune due to an act of kindness that his father performed, and therefore it is fitting for God to be kind to the son as a result. So we all we all rest on the laurels of our ancestors, even those of us who are doing what we're supposed to. When we dabble, we always say, what do we say? We are the children of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, because we want to remind Hashem, this is who we are. This is who we are. Even if I'm not the best Jew that I can be, remember who my ancestors are. So yes, our ancestors do have impact on us the same way that there's generational trauma, there's generational beauty that gets handed down. So sometimes the wicked person is prospering because of the merits of his ancestors. Okay, and here he's gonna bring examples. So we're on the bottom of page 97. As God said to Yeshu, the son of Nimshi, your descendants of the fourth generation shall occupy the throne of Israel, and he who walks innocently is righteous, fortunate are his sons after him. Similarly, it says in Tehillim, I was young, I also aged, and I have not seen a righteous man forsaken and his children seeking bread. Number six, the final reason. There are some wicked people who God makes proper, prosper for the purpose of testing who is pretending to be righteous to deceive others and who is hiding their wickedness out of fear of other people. When these people see the success of the wicked, they hasten to turn away from the service of the creator and try to appease the wicked and learn from their ways. As a result, it will become clear which people are wholehearted in their service of God and which are truly loyal in their service of God. When they tolerate the times when others rule over them and embarrass them for it, they will be rewarded by the creator for this, as we know from the story of Elijah, who was pursued by Jezebel and similarly with Yirmiyahu, who was persecuted by the rulers of his generation. So this is actually very interesting here. Why does he allow some wicked people to suffer? Is to test other people in the vicinity of this wicked person. So say person A is wicked and he's doing great in life. He is really making it. He's happy. He go on his social media. He's traveling. He's going on vacations. He's on this ship. He's on at a concert with his family. And you're like, wow. This guy, this family, they are thriving. So here I am, not really sure. Am I really connected to Hashem? Or am I pretending to the outside world that I'm a good Jew, that I'm connected to Hashem? Now I see this guy over here, and he is not connecting to Hashem. He's not even a decent human being. So hey, he's thriving. I'm going to go and be like him. So what this does, it, it weeds out the people who are truly connected to Hashem. And regardless as to what they see outside of themselves, someone else prospering, someone else doing well, and seemingly they don't deserve it. Oh, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go be like them. They are completely, go. they're exposing themselves and they're completely going against Hashem. While on the other side, a person who watches this wicked person seemingly having the best life and says, you know what? What that person does is that person's business. I am going to remain connected. And I know that God will provide me with what I need. So I just want to go back a little bit to when we talked about one of the reasons why righteous suffer. And I believe, just give me a second, what number, what reason that was, is because they did not impact their surroundings. They were righteous, but they didn't go out into the community and say, hey guys, the way you're behaving is really not good. We need to make a change. We need to elevate. We need to do something better, inspire them, teach them, learn with them. So the comparable to that is, there's what's called a tzaddik in pelts. What is that? It's, let's say you're in a freezing cold space, right? And there's a lot of people 
in that same freezing cold space with you. I can take a coat, put a coat on, and I will be warm. I'm comfortable, I'm content, I'm no longer freezing. Everyone else in that room is still frozen. Or I could do is I can light a candle. And then not just I will be warm, but everyone in that space will be warm. So many of us do shy away from criticizing other people. Like, who am I to tell somebody how to behave? The more that we're connected with this truth of Hashem running this world and having our backs, the less intimidated, the less fearful we are of speaking Hashem's truth. And I'm not saying to walk over to any random person, but people that we have relationships with, people that we have close friendships with, people that we care about, and we see them doing something that's contrary to what God wants, and it's affecting their lives in a bad way, we should be able to sit with them in a kind and loving and non-judgmental way and tell them what you're doing isn't the right way. Let's go on a journey together. Let me show you how you can celebrate your Judaism, not just feel suffocated by it. Let me help you. Let me show you some of what I found. But we all of us need to be able to learn to do that. Now, also, before you critique someone, in order for them to really be able to hear what you say, is tell them something kind. Sit down with them and tell them the beautiful things that you see about them. You start with that. Then they're open. You've opened their heart space. Now they're willing to hear from you. And they already understand this is a person who cares. She's highlighted all the things that I do that's good. So if she's telling me there's something that I need to work on, this is a person I want to listen to. I want to hear what she has to say. So if each of us can attempt to start doing that, that would be fantastic. Okay, so we finish um, number six. And I think we will end class today because the next topic starts at the bottom of the page. Thank you all for being here. Oh, and remember, jot down those questions. Jot down those questions. Thank you, Dvoralea. That was excellent. Uh, that was uh, the 21st uh, class of Sharbi Tahan. I just want to let you know a uh, quote of the Rebbe, but before we do, on the description of this recording of the class, Dvoralea mentioned uh, Tamar and Shahar family friends. I know them personally. I actually merited to visit him in the hospital um, before his wedding. And um, I'm going to, she spoke on our class and she shared her the story. So I'm going to put it in the link in the description as long as well as class one through 20, if you wanna make up. Um, so look out for it. So here is the quote of today from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a saying I would say, um, here it goes. God grants wealthy people the unique potential to contribute to the world, to help those around them, just as when a person does his or her job success successfully, the employer will assign more duties. So too, when one uses wealth for God, for godly purposes, God rewards the entrust. God rewards and entrusts one with more wealth to use. So we do this class in memory of our dear grandmothers, Rivka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda and Rachel Bela Bas Schneer Zalman. We hope you're proud. And we'll see you next time.